Good to go? Yes, I think cool. we could start. Uh, well, I guess good morning, everyone, uh, for the second talk of today. I'm John Dickerson. I'm coming from the University of Maryland, where I am an assistant professor of computer science. I was just here a couple weeks ago uh, giving a talk on some Wi-Fi issues. Great. Uh, some work that I've been doing in blood donation, matching markets for blood donation. And today I'll be talking about some sort of complementary work that's looking at uh, the promotion of diversity in a broad sense in matching markets where you have some uncertainty over potentially what vertices will arrive in the future or the value of edges that are going to be matched. Um, so I know that this will be sort of old hat for everyone here, but for those who are watching online later, uh, we'll be talking today about matching markets. And so these are uh, a, a type of problem, basically, where prices aren't going to do all or even any of the work of matching supply and demand. Uh, I'll motivate the audience uh, with uh, some pictures here. So here we're going to have agents who are paired with other agents or potentially groups of other agents. Okay, so we'll generalizations to the B-matching case uh, or transactions or contracts, right? Like, so we have a lot of examples of different matching markets, uh, traditionally matching workers to firms, uh, children to schools, as was just discussed, residents to hospitals and sort of the, the very classic case, patients to donors, uh, which we won't be talking about today. For those of you who know me, I talk about that a lot in other talks. Uh, and matching advertisements to viewers um, uh, is how a lot of us get our new fancy computer science buildings. So this is a nice problem to think about as well. Uh, and finally, matching riders to rideshare drivers. And so a lot of the platform markets talks have been from you know, the Ubers and the Lyfts and the DDs of the world. And they do a really interesting job of matching drivers uh, to riders. Great. So these are examples of matching problems. In today's talk, I'm going to talk about moving beyond uh, sort of linear maximization in these markets. And this obviously isn't the first work that does this, but I'll be focusing on it for a particular context, which is diversity promotion. Great. So the value of a matching uh, is sometimes more and sometimes less than the sum of its individual parts. Right. So for example, let's say we're matching workers to tasks in some online labor market, you know, via Upwork or something. It might be the case that we don't want to match three identical workers to a task. Instead, we want to have coverage of, say, somebody who speaks English, somebody who speaks French, and somebody who speaks Spanish, and they're all going to label an image uh, with different sort of forms uh, of the same label. We may have soft constraints, right? There might be synergies uh, uh, in the workforce. Say you're hiring and you uh, want to hire 10 uh, programmers. Maybe you want five programmers who program in Java and five programmers who are more on the front end side programming in, I don't know, HTML and, and JavaScript, stuff like that. And of course, we may have hard constraints. There's been a lot of nice work coming out recently in sort of the matching literature, which looks at diversity via quota constraints. Right? So another example is in internet advertising. We might uh, want to balance the reach and the frequency uh, of advertisements, right? The number of individuals that we, that, we, that we hit with a particular advertisement roughly is the reach, and the number of times or the frequency with which I hit a particular individual with an advertisement uh, is roughly, roughly called the frequency, right? So in some settings, we might have the law of diminishing returns kick in here, where if I hit your eyeballs with the same advertisement 15 times in a row, well, that 15th advertisement maybe is going to return less value to the central matching system than that first advertisement or second advertisement. There's, you know, decades of work in the marketing literature that looks into that as well. So what are ways that we could talk about diversity? Well, we have these hard constraints. I could have, you know, a constraint uh, in some mathematical program that I'm solving. We could have soft, soft constraints that we can push into the objective. And one way we could do that is by using some modular functions. Right? So we want to enforce the law of diminishing returns. Well, we can do this via some modularity. And again, for this audience, I'm almost certain that we don't need a slide like this. Uh, but when we're watching these things on YouTube, it's good to have them. So a some modular function f is going to uh, be a mapping of uh, these uh, subsets of elements, ground elements, n of them, uh, to the reals. And we're going to call it some modular if for every subset of elements A and B of that set of n elements, uh, if we add together F applied to the union of that subset and F applied to the intersection of that subset, it's going to be weakly less than uh, F applied to each of the individual subsets. Okay. There are a bunch of different ways to write this. Uh, you can just trust me that that is going to enforce diminishing marginal return. We're going to call this monotone as well if for every subset B of those elements n, and every smaller subset A of those elements in B, the value of F on the smaller subset is weakly less than the value of F on the larger subset. Okay. So there's uh, nothing sort of new here. But this is the sort of objective we'll be focusing on in today's talk. 
So uh, today I'm going to focus on, and this is a pretty early talk, this is pretty early stage work, so I would love to you know, get some feedback from the crowd as well, especially on the last part of, 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 of my talk. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on balancing diversity and efficiency, economic efficiency, in a principled way. And in the interest of time, uh, I'll drop the, the first third of this, this lecture, which focuses on offline diverse matching. So I have a couple recent papers that look at offline, and that sense, I mean, uh, uh, we know the vertices U and the vertices V in some bipartite graph, a priori. Instead, today, I'll focus on online diverse bipartite matching. So here, we're going to have uh, uh, one side of the vertices in a bipartite graph arriving online. And I'll define what I mean by that in a couple slides. Okay. So in online diverse bipartite matching with applications to things like crowdsourcing or dating markets or advertising markets, uh, we're going to be interested in, say, maximizing the expected value of some sort of uh, function over time. And I'll end the talk with a discussion of some ongoing work I have uh, that looks at hiring a diverse cohort of workers. And we're going to take a multi-armed bandit approach to hiring. So we're going to take a multi-armed bandit approach to learning about the elements in our system. And then we're going to select some subset of those elements. Uh, uh, and we'll hope that it does a good job of doing that, right? And uh, I'll discuss this in the context of academic hiring, which is to say graduate admissions. And we've been running some experiments at the University of Maryland, uh, which has one of the largest computer science departments uh, in the nation. I think we have like 4,300 undergrads at this point who are primary majors in CS, and we have a few hundred PhD students. Uh, so we've been running an ongoing experiment at the University of Maryland looking at just beginning to apply some of what I'm going to talk about. And that's the part that I want to get feedback on from this crowd. Great. And if we get to it, I'll leave you with some open questions, but these talks very rarely get to that. Perfect. So any questions so far before I hop into this online matching model? So early, I know. Great. So this is going to uh, be covering some work uh, with uh, my student, Pan Shu, who's now an assistant professor, and some colleagues uh, at the University of Maryland, and Kartik, who's now down the street as a research scientist at, at Facebook. So. Here's the online model that we'll be operating in. We have a bipartite graph, not shocking. We know u entirely offline, and we're going to assume that v arrives one by one, sequentially. Okay. Uh, we have t time steps. At every time step t, we're going to sample some vertex v from a known distribution d. Okay. So we have some types of vertices. At every time step t, we're going to sample a vertex v uh, at most one. It's going to arrive, and at that point, we're going to need to assign it immediately, so we can't, uh, we can't uh, batch edges as they arrive, and irrevocably, which is to say that if I assign some vertex v to some vertex u, I can't then go back in time and, and play around with the matching. Right? So we're going to irrevocably and immediately assign v to a vertex u on the offline side, or we'll reject v. Okay? So I can say, I don't like you, v. Go away. I won't get any points for that. Uh, we'll make some standard assumptions. For example, t is really big, and uh, the online side is really big compared to the offline side. Our goal is going to be to maximize the, uh, some non-negative monotone and some modular, if you recall from that previous slide. Some non-negative monotone some modular function f over the edges e that we've matched. Right? Explicitly, our goal is to design an algorithm, alg, it's going to find this matching m, which is a subset of the edges e that have arrived, such that an expectation, uh, I want to maximize the value of that f, uh, so modular monotone f on, on my edges e. Sorry, JP, the size of the right hand side is uh, the online side is much larger, as in the support of the distribution is much larger, or as in there will be much more uh, online nodes and offline nodes? Much more online nodes than offline nodes, that's right. So uh, unsurprisingly, we'll take a two-phase approach to designing this algorithm alg. We'll separate the algorithm into two phases. Offline, we'll obtain some upper bound, some LP upper bound, well, uh, some math program-based upper bound on the offline optimal solution. And remember, we know the distribution d from which these vertices v are arriving. We know u entirely offline, so we can do something like this. Then online, we're going to use the result that pops out of our offline optimal optimistic solution to guide our matching algorithm. And the offline optimal solution is going to be uh, making heavy use of what's called the multilinear extension of a submodular function. 
So right, f is only defined on these, 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 these subsets of the ground elements. Uh, so we can create a continuous uh, uh, related function, capital F, the multilinear extension of that submodular function, which is defined over all subsets of the elements n, and then sort of smoothed out using these continuous variables xj. Uh, if you haven't seen these before at a high level, the things to take home here are that uh, it's continuous, which is great. So maybe we can do better optimization or easier optimization with it. Uh, and it's going to be equal to the underlying submodular function f on the integral points here. Okay. And there are sort of probabilistic interpretations of it that say things like, uh, if we have this R, Rx here, which is going to be some random sample of the ground elements, such that we've sampled an element xi with probability xi, we include it in that sample. Otherwise, with probability 1 minus xi, we don't include it in that sample. So call this Rx. Um, then we can say that the multilinear extension, capital F, on that x is just going to be the expected value of our underlying submodular function uh, uh, as we draw from this x, right? So that second bullet point is going to be the intuition that we're going to use uh, for guiding our online solution after we solve this offline optimal. Okay. So our offline phase, we'll solve the following program, which is uh, in our paper, we should, we, you know, this, is, this is an upper bound on what opt could do. So we're going to maximize the multilinear extension of our underlying monotone submodular function f subject to uh, some matching constraints. Right? So this first constraint is going to say the expected number of matches for any type v is going to be at most the rate at which it's arriving, right? We know the distribution offline, so we, we have this RV floating around as well. And then on the offline side, we have a matching constraint, right? We, we're, going to, we're going to match every vertex u at most once in expectation. So these two constraints are very sort of common, and our objective is going to be this multilinear extension of that underlying submodular function f. So, Hey, you know, if f is linear, uh, which is, which is monotone submodular, we can solve this exactly, right? This is just an LP. If f is not linear, if it's monotone submodular, then we can solve it uh, approximately. He has some nice recent results. One minus one. So we do this offline. Uh, we do this offline, and it's going to give us a probability distribution x star. Right? And we're going to sample from that during the online phase. So what do I mean by that? Well, all right, so first solve that previous program for x star. We can do this uh, within a nice, uh, in p time, within 1 minus 1 over e of opt. All right, so if you have a lot of computers, you could, you could you know, edge up on that a little bit more. And we'll design two very simple online algorithms that will use this x star probability dis distribution to do online matching. The first is going to be a multilinear maximization-based program. I'm just calling it MMP alg here. Really simple idea. So remember, we have u offline. v is arriving one by one. We have to make a decision immediately when v arrives. We're going to make a decision immediately when v arrives. Well, hey, v is going to arrive. We have a set of edges e that appear with v. Call these safe edges, right? If I've matched u already and that, e, u, that u, v edge could have existed, I won't include it. So take all the safe edges uh, that exist between v and anyone on the u side who's not currently matched and just uh, oh. Actually, no, include all the edges, sorry, uh, and then sample from all the edges with this probability, which says, hey, if that edge was included with higher weight in my optimal offline solution, then sample it with higher weight, but downrate it if that vertex type is appearing a lot. Okay. So if we want to interpret this, if there's an edge type that is included in that opt solution that we did offline, and it's rarely going to arrive, then we're going to sample it with really high probability. And if it's really, really common, we'll sample it with slightly lower probability. And if the offline opt didn't include it very much and it arrives a lot, then we're going to basically never sample it. The second algorithm that we're going to use is based on the uh, sort of contention resolution techniques that have been coming out in the last decade or so. Uh, and the rough idea here is going to be, again, to take our offline optimal solution x star, which is fractional, and sample some binary vector y from that in the offline phase. So fix some binary vector y in the offline phase, and then use y in the online phase instead of this 
coin flipping over the X star, like we do in the MMP algorithm. So they're two super, super, super simple algorithms. Um, the first question everyone always asks is, hey, like, what can we say about these algorithms? Uh, so we'll take this competitive ratio definition and we'll prove some stuff about those two algorithms. So the competitive ratio I'm defining here um, is gonna be uh, this sort of worst case result over all possible instances of the problem of the expected <coughs> value of our algorithm that we've designed where that expectation is taken over both the internal randomness, the coin flips in the algorithm and the arrival sequences and the expected value of what an offline optimal or sorry, an optimal solution could have done, right? And we have this LP, or the, not this LP, this math program up, upper bound, so we, we have sort of a weak view on what xopt can be. Great. And if we get closer to one, that's good. If we get closer to zero, that's bad. So that contention resolution-based algorithm, uh, when the arrival rates of the vertices are, are integral, is gonna achieve in a competitive ratio uh, where we're dropping the one minus one over E from that inability to solve to optimality a uh, multilinear extension of, of F. We're dropping this one minus one over E, uh, and then this is the remaining uh, worst case loss that we'll get from the CR algorithm. And this MMP based one, uh, under constraints on the offline side, is gonna achieve a competitive ratio where we're only losing one minus one over E on top of that that loss from the, uh, the, the multilinear extension. Okay. So in a setting where we have uh, an appropriately sized U with respect to our time over which we're planning, MMP is gonna do a pretty good job. Second one minus one over E is from the integrality gap. Maybe. That's right, yeah, yeah. And we, yeah, so we, we, we show that this is, uh, uh, in the paper, that's, it's tight with respect to that, that upper bound, uh, the, the opt that we, we, we play around with, yeah. Yeah, so I'd like to put this up there, even though we have this constraint on you, because it's, it's a bit nicer. Also, we have some early exploratory experiments where we run on two common submodular functions. The first is uh, budget additive. So here we're going to get points uh, until we run out of budget. So I match an edge, I get the value of that edge up until I hit a budget cap. Okay. And we can break this out over each of the, say, offline vertices U if we want to, or clumps of the offline vertices U to sort of start to mimic things like advertising markets a bit more. And we'll also do some experiments on a weighted coverage function. Uh, the framework here is gonna be uh, uh, using an extension to B matching, so we'll allow actually the offline vertices to be matched up to B times, only an upper bound. And we'll vary sort of the constrainedness of the problem using this number of times you can match to U, okay? So one sort of is really constrained all the way up to say an infinite number of times matching to U, well you can do a pretty good job on that one. And our benchmark here is gonna be the offline true optimal. So we're gonna solve a big omniscient math program uh, 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 to optimality. We can do that because we have a lot of patience and because people have been spending time solving things to optimality. So our early experiments will compare against some uh, sort of I won't say naive baselines, but the baselines you would expect. So one based on dependent rounding, uh, one based on greedy, so choosing an available neighbor that maximizes, say, marginal gain in that submodular function f uh, every time v comes in. Uh, and if that doesn't exist, we'll drop v. And then our two algorithms from earlier, the, 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 the multilinear extension one and the contention resolution one, MMP and CR. And some interesting early results pop out of this. Um, so this is for not a super constrained case. Uh, so we have this budget uh, from one, which is very constrained, all the way up to 15, which is uh, getting less constrained. So we're gonna beat greedy really, really nicely here. And sort of unsurprisingly, we're gonna beat the competitive ratios that we proved for both those algorithms pretty well as well, right? So here in green and blue, we have the two algorithms that we present. Uh, the competitive ratios, if you, if you roll the math out, are, you know, Oh, because we're solving to optimality, they're, they're higher than you might think. Um, uh, we're, we're doing a lot better there. But one thing that surprised us actually is when we look at slightly uh, more difficult objectives, like that weighted coverage one, uh, greedy starts winning, uh, which, is, which is interesting. So maybe we need to do a little bit more work on that. But again, we're, we're gonna have these nice theoretical results wrapped around the two algorithms that we proposed. Cool. Uh, 
So that's the first half of what I wanted to talk about, just to sort of get, get you in the mood of using some modularity to promote diversity um, in these matching markets, yeah? So modularity is one way of thinking about diversity. I know, yeah. Could just uh, more easily implemented in an uh, online decision making. Right? That's, yeah, like DPPs, for instance, are a good example of this. Like more kind of intuitive ways that oh, I already chose from this particular uh, group. Maybe now I want to go to another group. Yeah. I'm wondering if you thought about like directions. And yeah. So I, I like what you're what you're talking about, which would be I, I, I'll try and interpret that live. So we have, say, some set of types for vertices, and we're trying to equalize some set of like sampling from each of the types of vertices. Yeah. There's more intuition there compared to just optimizing the like, some modular function, right? That's right. Um, it, it might be harder. I guess you could bring the weights into that constraint as well. So maybe you, you want to equalize the, the weighted sums of your sampling. No, we can take it offline. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. So every time I've, I've talked to people about this, so that, that comment comes up. It's sort of related to quota-based, sort of, right? Uh, the DPP comment comes up. So if you talk to folks in industry, um, at the, you know, the, the people who actually do advertising, a lot of them actually do these determinantal point process-based approaches to doing diversity promotion. And those come with their own sort of set of issues. So one issue is that you need a ton of data to be able to use these accurately. Whereas in like a hiring application, you might not have a ton of data. Um, uh, I think that pretty much sums up the, the three different approaches. Uh, if, you, if you're computing an offline solution, that also needs a ton of data, right? Uh, you need to have like pretty good uh, estimates. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there. So yeah, there are certainly pros and cons to all of these. And one issue here is also like, like you said, there there is a lack of intuition in that some modular function. Like, how do we? You're going to see I use just like an arbitrary some modular function in this one, which is like a sum of some square roots. Uh, how do you decide on that? Um, and uh, we have some ongoing work actually in two applications that are looking at sort of active learning based ways of, of asking the crowd what they think should be a, di a diverse but good set of, uh, of elements. So in, in this context, it's going to be a diverse but good set in, a, in a, what we're calling a, a fantasy university where you're trying to hire a bunch of different faculty members and they have a, a bunch of different uh, uh, types associated with them. And we're asking, you know, uh, 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 basically what, what, like what form of entropy do you want to use? Um, yeah, it's. I don't know if there's a good answer here. Uh, there are actually like like legal issues with using quota-based uh, diversity promotion in some areas. So maybe that comment that you made would not even be legal in some areas. Uh, it, it's unclear though. Yeah. It's very general. I was just wondering if for that particular application, more can. For hiring specifically. For diversity, like if the objective is actually just what in. I do see eye to eye with you on this. Like, this is not the, I think, the only way to do this, for sure, for sure, yeah. Cool. So, we have a long-term goal, and that is to start looking at diversity and fairness promotion in hiring practices. Uh, so, matching workers to firms, or matching graduate students to universities. Um, and I've just started with my, my student, Candace Schumann, uh, working on, on this space uh, in the context of graduate admission. So keep those submodular thoughts in your mind or keep quota-based thoughts in your mind. I think both of them would work sort of in an interesting way here. Let's walk now into a hiring setting. So say you're a company and you want to hire a team of workers. Or say you're a university and you want to hire a cohort of graduate students from some large pool of applicants. So what do you want? Well, you certainly want high individual worker quality. So you want good fit between a worker's skill set and the tasks that you're going to ask that worker to do. But you might also want good interplay between the workers. So this has come up, for example, at the University of Maryland, where we accept many PhD students. I mean, we get a huge pool of PhD students. Our acceptance rate is actually pretty low. But we end up accepting, I think, well over 100 PhD students per year to the computer science department. And, uh, and we don't want to accept, say, 100 machine learning theory students or something like that, because then all of our programming languages faculty will leave, and that's not good. <coughs> we'll have constraints. right? There's an interviewing budget or cost. For us, there's, there's an explicit budget. Uh, the University of Maryland is, is a public university, so we are, we are often budget constrained. Uh, but there's also a time budget, right? So when you get thousands of applications, uh, you don't want a human to actually sit down and, and spend, say, four hours on every single application. We also have uncertainty over individual quality. So for the sake of this talk, let's assume that we have two general ways to gain information. 
And I have a paper coming out at NeurIPS in a couple months that generalizes a lot of this. But for the sake of this talk, let's assume that we have two ways of gathering information. One is a resume screening, say an automated resume screening, or in the case of the University of Maryland, we actually have graduate students and faculty go into sort of a homegrown application system and, and, and rate students on various dimensions. So we have a cheap resume screen, and we have a slightly more expensive in-person interview, say a Skype interview, that our graduate admissions committee will do. Now these resume screens are extremely cheap in terms of time or money, but they don't give you a ton of information. These in-person interviews are a bit more expensive, certainly in terms of time, and maybe they do give you more information. And you can imagine pushing this out into flyouts, into phone screens, into you know, coding questions, things like that. Our key question then is, how should a company or a university allocate its limited interviewing resources to select the best wherever best came from, could be some modular, could be not, cohort of new employees from a large set of, of, of job applicants, right? Specific to this talk, how should a company, say, allocate these cheap but noisy resume screenings and these expensive but in-depth in-person interviews sequentially and such that we come in under budget? So our high-level approach is going to be to model this as a MAB problem, a multi-armed bandit problem in uh, the combinatorial pure exploration space. So what that says is that we're, we're going to think really hard, we're going to do information gathering, and then at the end of the day, we're going to pick some subset of these arms to call our cohort. Okay. So each applicant in this talk is going to be represented by an arm. We have uncertainty over the true value of that individual arm. We can learn about those arms. We can pull those arms at some cost to gain information. And our goal is to find the optimal cohort, maximizing some objective by selectively pulling arm. Okay. And like I said, that pure exploration is going to be, hey, learn, 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 and then pick the best set in a one-shot deal. So the model will clear. Can you put an arm from what, what do you get? A noisy signal? Yeah, this is just going to be a, a one-dimensional noisy. Yeah, it's, it's the standard map setting there. I'll pull an arm and maybe I'll get some value between 0 and 1. Yeah. Great. So we'll build on some nice recent work that came from Chen et al. I think this started with a, it was NIPS at the time, a NeurIPS paper in 2014. Uh, we're going to select a subset of arms, or that work presents a method for selecting a subset of arms with a certain combinatorial structure, for example, a size upper bound or a matching structure. They uh, give two nice algorithms. Uh, one's a fixed con confidence algorithm and one's a fixed budget setting. And we generalize both of these to, uh, in the first paper, into having two ways of gathering information instead of just one. Having these cheap but bad and expensive but good methods for sampling. And like I said, we have work coming out in a couple of months that generalizes this much further. Okay. So I'll use the language weak polls, the equivalent to a resume screening of a candidate, where we're going to get some gain S which is set to 1, at some cost uh, j, which is set to 1 as well. This is the traditional MAB poll. But maybe we also have some strong poll, which is going to give us more gain in information at some greater cost j. Uh, so in this initial work, we presented a strong, weak arm poll algorithm, which gave us a nice acronym, SWAP. Uh, uh, and the theory side of this is proved just for linear objectives, not for some modular yet. Uh, in the experiments, I'm going to use a general monotonous modular function, but it's going to choose which arms to pull sequentially and when, when to pull them based on some oracle. Okay. And those oracles are going to be, in the experimental setting, uh, a full optimal solve for a monotonous modular function. The theory we have is just for the linear case, though. So what does swap look like? It's a nice sort of intuitive algorithm. Well, first, we're going to initialize the empirical means for every one of the arms. So in the applicant setting, this is going to be, say, running we actually do have some basic like ML stuff, which says things like you know, number of publications, GRE, percentiles, quartiles, stuff like that. Uh, run those cheap but bad arm pulls at least once, uh, exactly once on every arm. And then repeat the following steps until we're confident enough. Okay, so we're going to ask the oracle for the best set of arms given our current empirical means. Now, we have error bars around this, right? So we can task now instead for the uh, optimistic best set of arms, which is to say, let's assume that every empirical mean is at the top of that error bar, and the pessimistic best set of arms, which is to say that the true, uh, our, our guess would be the true mean would be the bottom, 
uh, 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 of those error bars. Okay, so we have these two sets. If they're identical, which sort of if you want to visualize that means that we have some set of arms floating up here such that even their sort of worst pessimistic instantiations put them above the best case instantiations of all the other arms. So we have this like separated group that really look good. If the best case and the worst case are the same, call it quits. Otherwise, take the symmetric difference between that optimistic and pessimistic cohort and think about that. Choose the most uncertain arm that we have. <coughs> And probabilistically weak or strong pull it. Okay. And I think in this talk I don't go into sort of where these alphas are coming from, but we're going to do a probabilistic method for sampling. Okay. So the generalization here is that if, if alpha is equal to zero, then, uh, then this is just sort of a standard map. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'm just going to breeze over these theor theoretical results. So we have some pack bounds and we have some some budget, fixed budget bounds here. Um, I don't think that these are as important anymore because we have this new oncoming work coming out, but our overview of the theoretical results is we extend this nice paper to Dechen et al. to the case of uh, arm poles that cost you some j that's, say, greater than one, uh, but also give you some s uh, in information back. And we give some nice results as well in this paper that uh, uh, explore different probabilistic polling policies, right? So if alpha is zero, then we just have weak pull only. If we have alpha equals to one, then we only have strong poles and everything in between. Uh, and like I said, these are only for the linear case right now. So that's, that's sad. What I wanted to do in this talk, now that we're properly motivated, is to discuss sort of an ongoing experiment that we have looking at uh, a matching market that's near and dear to all our hearts, which is to say uh, 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 graduate admissions, right? Most of us, I think, have gone through this at least at some point. So our initial motivation here was incorporating diversity into real-world hiring processes. Uh, and I'll do this real-world experiment in the academic real world, which is in graduate admissions. So we're going to use actual admissions data from the University of Maryland's Department of Computer Science uh, to run some experiments here. Okay? We'll do some simulation experiments, and we also have some online, ongoing ghosting experiments. All of this is IRB approved. Um, because it sounds very scary to use sort of ML uh, to do hiring, and I totally agree with you on that. All of this is IRB approved. We're not actually making decisions based on this yet, because that, that would be scary. Uh, and we're starting to work with a couple of quantitative hiring firms in this space as well, just for data. So formally promoting diversity uh, with, with swaps. So here's where this arbitrary submodular function came out. It's not that arbitrary. So this is a, a, a submodular function from the recommender systems literature, which says, hey, we have some set of k types. And uh, we're going to sum over each of the types the square root of the value of all the people I matched to in that type. So that square root is going to uh, enforce sort of diminishing marginal return, right? So if I have exactly one match of a specific type, uh, then I will get more sort of marginal gain from that one match than I would if I had, say, four or five matches of that individual type. So in our settings, we're going to look at applicant attributes such as region or gender or area of interest, right? So uh, AI, ML, HCI, and so on. So here's our setup. Uh, we trained a classifier on past admissions data. I think these numbers should be updated. We've been doing this uh, for quite a while now uh, to model decisions of the Graduate Admissions Committee. Okay. Again, we are not making actual admissions decisions. So all the thoughts of bias that you're thinking right now, I'm thinking them as well. Uh, we have a numerical score in, in negative one to positive, or sorry, negative two to positive two in terms of quality. This comes from our homegrown system that we run behind the scenes at Maryland, where reviewers are actually going in and rating people both in terms of natural language processing based, uh, sorry, in terms of natural language, but also in terms of like a true numeric value. We also have an actual admissions decision. Okay? So we have, did we choose to admit or did we not choose to admit this student? Uh, we also do, you know, your standard data mining stuff. So, uh, 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 you know, we run optical character recognition on scans of statements of purpose uh, and on uh, uh, recommendation letters. Um, and then we do your, you know, your first data science approach to doing anything with text, so LDA and, and feature extraction. We also uh, look through... So can you explain, I don't know what LDA is, and can you explain what, how, how do you use stuff in open text for your decision? I don't understand. Uh, this is all going into a feature vector for the applicant. Okay, what, the, what does that mean? Uh, well, what we want at the end of the day is 
a... Uh, so, yeah, you want to say something about whether the applicant is good or not, right? So, That's right. Uh, but how the, I just don't, don't understand how you use word counts to do you that. You train it with the previous data. So, yeah. so if the word excellent appears in previous successful candidates research <laughs> statements, then okay. No. Yeah. So you can do this. There's actually a lot of like, I know. there's a lot of literature on on this this kind of thing, which is to to try and interpret, say, recommendation letters, how good or how bad they are. So for example, there's a lot of uh, this is from like the psychology literature, and we implement this as well, which looks at trying to count things like uh, standout, grindstone, and ability-based words in in uh, in the recommendation letters. Rhinestone, that's now I know why I, I, didn't I get know these, exactly. why I get this type of letters. Okay. Yeah. People are already adapting. People, and some of this is from quite a while ago as well. So like our, our initial work, I think, is in the '90s, uh, and then up to the early 2000s, people really started looking at this, um, and so we just automate that, right? So the OCR is going to say, "You give me a PDF scan from some other country." We have to actually pick out the text, and then we can do uh, some basic. Uh, feature extraction from the text, and then we do some some additional feature extraction from like the literature that looks at that recommendation letters. We also have sort of the obvious numeric data associated with students as well, so the GPA, a GRE, and so on. But the end goal is that these are going to be inputs into some sort of classifier, or actually a regression model, which is going to predict some sort of numeric score for the student. The objective from the previous slide is only part of the objective, right? You're not only optimizing diversity, also on some. Quality, yeah. yeah, so the, the quality measurement is pushed into this UA. Yeah, so obviously if U goes up, then we're going to get uh, some additional gain from that, yeah. Great. So using that classifier, we ran some simulations of swap, diversifying for different sets of attributes. For example, uh, in our application up until about two years ago, you only had a self-reported binary gender, so that's what we worked on. Uh, region of origin. Uh, and then we compared these results with past admissions decisions, right? And past admissions decisions are clearly not a proxy for utilitarian matching. So actually on a couple of these papers is the professor who was the graduate admissions director at the time. So he gave us a lot of input. Obviously, he was doing some sort of coverage-based admissions as well. Um, and we can obviously compare against a simulated utilitarian matching based on committee scores. So what if people had just accepted the top K based on the committee scores? The caveats here, obviously, these are not policy recommendations. Uh, imagine, uh, I, I can imagine a ton of negative and positive feedback here. So we are obviously learning from past review scores, which is going to be biased as all heck. Uh, the real scores given without additional information are, um, uh, sorry, our, our simulated sort of Skype interviews are only going to give you a particular type of information, right? So if I do a resume screen versus a Skype interview, uh, one of these isn't just worth five times the resume screen. I'm also I'm getting like additional information that isn't even part of the resume screen when I do a Skype interview, right? Um, and that might bias me as well. Uh, when comparing against reality, like I said, we don't really know all the soft operational constraints that went into the actual admissions decisions. We're assuming you can measure the true utility of a student. And we are working with a bunch of people outside of computer science right now to try and start alleviating some of these issues. So we have some grants in looking at debiasing, and we have a longitudinal study that's just booting up at Maryland, which is going to track students' success over many, many years. So hopefully we can start pushing back against this. So in terms of admissions experiment results, uh, we do end actually end up with some, some pretty interesting and uh, uh, I would say motivational results. So basically, if we push for uh, diversifying over particular types, for example, the self-reported binary gender or region of origin, we're actually able to increase sort of the coverage of these types at essentially no cost to the utilitarian value that pops out of, of the cohort that we accept. Um, and I won't go in depth into like what these numbers actually mean, but qualitatively that's true. We can rearrange cohorts that are accepted such that we diversify substantially at basically no price of diversity, right, in, in, in practice. Um, and some of the results that you would expect to happen do in fact happen. These are actual admissions decisions from one of the years at Maryland where there's a huge bias toward North American students and you can start diversifying over, say, region of origin with almost no loss to utilitarian quality. So I have about five minutes left, is that right? Or? Uh, now it's only two minutes left. I, I showed you the five, right? Yeah, but it's 41. <laughs> My watch is a bit early, but it's okay. Uh, you can go. So we have some extensions. Uh, we ran a live version of this 
during the 2018 PhD hiring season, again, just alongside of the admissions. We're not actually making decisions. Um, yeah, I guess I don't have too much time to go into this. Uh, uh, via IRB approved language, we were able to talk to students actually sort of after the admissions decisions were out and run Skype interviews to see sort of how much additional information we might gain. We can talk about this offline. So we have actual estimates for these values S and J, S being the amount of information you gain and J being the extra cost that a Skype interview cost you. In our case, it was about six times the amount of time to do a Skype interview than to look over somebody's resume. We did pick this fairly arbitrary submodular function. Um, like I said, my lab is actually working quite a bit on sort of human value judgment elicitation and aggregation to try and learn a better objective function that better reflects sort of the wants in this case of a committee of people who are looking to admit students. And one might ask, hey, how are we partitioning people, right? Like I'm partitioning based on these self-reported genders and region of origin. Uh, where did that come from? Shouldn't this be fuzzy? That's an open question as well. And I'd like to just end on this sort of nice extension that we have coming out at NeurIPS, and then I'll take questions. So we've expanded this model substantially. We just haven't run experiments on it yet. So basically, we've expanded this model to a tiered world where we're able to sub-select candidates over different stages of the application process. So say you're Google and you get 10 million applicants and you do your resume screen, and then you have budget for 10,000 phone screens and budget for 1,000 flyouts, and then final budget for 100 job offers. We have a nice extension into this world where uh, uh, you tell us the number of stages that you have and the budget that you have for every stage. Uh, and then we have an adaptive algorithm that will tell you sort of who and whom to allocate particular interventions to, and then how to sub-select down as you go from a million to 10,000 to 100. So this extends the swap model into both the pack and the fixed budget settings where we have general costs for arm pulls and general information gains for arm pulls <laughs> over multiple stages of hiring. And we ran some really basic experiments, really, really basic experiments on that graduate admissions data and, uh, and we're able to basically uh, 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 blow out of the water the actual admissions decisions that Marilyn made in our two-stage process, which is to do resume screen and then Skype interviews followed by an actual admissions offer. Uh, cool, so I will leave it at that. Thank you. Yep. It's kind of a meta learning, but meta question on whether multi arm bandits are the right approach for this problem. The multi arm bandits and pack approaches tend to work well when you have lots and lots of samples, noisy, noisy samples of an arm. I imagine here you can get at most like 10 unbiased reviews of how good a student is. So, do you think like there are other approaches which might work well, or do you have a reason why you think this is a good idea? Um, so, I agree with this. Uh, our baseline here is very cheap, very fast, say, ML-based screening. The idea is that even one bump up here, so once you start doing, say, a phone screen, you're getting a ton more information than a, than a resume screen. And so brushing a lot of details under the rug, if that a ton more information equates to something like 100 poles of an arm, then you sort of get around this issue a little bit. Um, so basically, by the time you're thinking about people that actually flew out, you've had thousands of information's worth of these like sort of cheap arm pulls down here. So the big question is, are you cutting off people too early on uh, based on just having one or two different sort of cheap, uh, cheap estimates of their signal? Uh, my guess is the, question, uh, the, the answer to that is still yes. Um, so you would, I don't know, have to bring in some extra signal there, right? Yeah. Yep. A question on the partitioning and the submodular function. Could you use actually past data and have some objective in the past which would help you automate that? For example, can I measure collaborations or the... Um, oh, I see. So, like a soft clustering that I've learned in some yeah. sense. I think that's right. Um, I don't know which measure to use, actually, to... I think that's... Yeah, I really don't know. So. So we, we cheat a little bit in that there is like a drop-down menu. I'm, I'm sure this is the case with most people's admissions where you have like, you know, I'm interested in AI first and comp bio second and theory third or whatever. Um, and so we're just using that to start with. I don't think that's the right way to partition people. Like uh, most of us in this room, for instance, would sit in multiple of those different, I, like I have this issue, right? Like I, I'm somewhere between theory and AI and ML and I don't know how I would even apply to myself. Um, so yeah, I think you should learn that in some way. Uh, it's unclear, I guess, these are graduate admissions, so a lot of these students barely have sort of a, an academic footprint, so you might have to learn that in some other way as well. Yeah. 
So I have, I have one question. If you use previous decisions to uh, to teach the algorithm, right? That's what you're doing. Then, but you were also hinting, and I'm not sure whether I understood this correctly, that you might also look at uh, at uh, the results of people that have been screened uh, both ways, possibly. But I was wondering. I mean, the problem is always you don't have the counterfactual, right? So you the people who have been hired and then you can see how the well they do but it would be interesting to know what even the in person screening that's, did wrong right there's yeah. all this homophily oh, stuff that's, that's, that's totally right that's yeah. totally right um, but, but i guess there is some liter literature in education also that does that I, i'm not so I'm not an expert in education that. and actually like even uh, like Hal Varian looked at this in like the 90s as well with an economics experiment um, we're so Maryland is part of the Big Ten, which I'm now learning about. I'm not a sports person, but I'm learning that this means something beyond sports, which is a, we, we're part of a research consortium. So we can actually pair with other universities in the Big Ten to try and start getting around some of this uh, counterfactual stuff. But I mean, at the end of the day, if somebody looks, looks bad to every single university and they just disappear, even though their true value was good, I, I don't know how to fight that necessarily. But we're, we're starting to, so th these are three big issues. One is the bias that we're going to encode, right? Like, let's say that John, prefers Econ CS candidates, and he was the admissions committee director for the last five years, then Econ CS candidates are going to look really good, and we're going to encode that. One, that's, that's bad. Two is this value of students. So like, we need some sort of like longitudinal study to say that a student that we accepted 10 years ago ends up being amazing, not just that like their GRE scores are really good and that makes you rate them well. And then three is exactly what you mentioned, which is this counterfactual analysis. And uh, there's just going to be a big sort of data mining project there, which is going to be tracking people that we rejected, where they went, right? So did they go to Google? Did they go to a sister uh, university uh, or, or, or so on? So what we want to do is start off actually looking at the faculty market as well, because there you can really track people a lot better. Most people, even if they don't say get a faculty position, don't disappear off the face of the internet. So we, we hopefully will be able to track them as well. Yeah, great. OK, one question. Can I say a bit of what the swap or whom the swap I will recommend to interview in the second stage. It's not necessarily the best people, but That's right. and uh, empirically, I mean. Do you um, know? Yeah, so what Swap ends up doing, and, and this actually follows the intuition that we had, which is you know, if you have this superstar 4.0 MIT grad with five papers applying to your university, um, well, it's still not clear that you should accept them if, if say, you're uh, Maryland. So we're top 10, but we're not top one, right, uh, in terms of a lot of metrics. And so there might be some adverse selection that goes on, but whatever. So this, this person at the, top of the, at the top of the list has such little uncertainty around their very high empirical mean that we're not going to Skype interview them. What these sort of swap algorithms start doing, and so ignore this for now, ignore the subselection part. What the swap algorithm does is it hits these borderline candidates that look like their empirical means are just below sort of the top K but their error bars are huge. And so we're gonna say, hey, we should think more about these candidates that we're really uncertain about. And so what, what happens there is, um, and there's a nice paper, I didn't get to it here, we have some extra work coming out soon uh, that also looks at uh, fairness in, in banded algorithms. So uh, there's, there's some nice work that came out of uh, like uh, Michael Kearns and Aaron Roth's group uh, in 2016 uh, that looks at uh, uh, fairness, individual fairness in, in multi arm bandits. And they basically make the, 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 this, this, this claim that uh, uh, yeah, you should never accept people who are fundamentally, you know, worse than the people that you're accepting up here. But when you have these error bars floating around that say, hey, you know, I think you, I think my best guess, my, my empirical mean for you is lower than, than most people that I'm looking at right now, but your error bars are really big because I have very few, say, training points, right? So these are the, the types of people that, that don't tend to apply to graduate school very often. Uh, then you should think really hard about these folks before rejecting or accepting them. Uh, and that's what Swap's doing as well. So it's the, it's the folks who are sort of borderline and borderline just under, uh, but have huge hair bars. So what's the practice of Maryland? Uh, uh, usually the best candidates are interviewed as well, right? Not for, uh, not for Skype interviews, no. Not for us. I don't know if you're coming from CS or Econ. No, it's econ. Uh, I see. So in computer science, at least, uh, the two universities I've been at, um, uh, offers are given before even flyouts. So in a lot of disciplines, like psychology, for instance, you actually do a flyout and interview somebody and then give them an offer. In CS, it's like, you know, if that, that, that case of the MIT 4.0 with five publications, we will put very little effort into accepting that person. You just look at that and you're like, all right, I'm going to accept this person. Um, so we, I doubt we would Skype interview. I mean, we might Skype interview to try to sell the person on coming to Maryland, for example, but yeah. Okay, I think we should uh, take a break and thank you again.